as we approach the 11th of November remembrance, I just felt compelled to to share something. Uh, and I've got a letter which uh, which I'd like to read to you. But before I do that, I just want to contextualise um, why. F- for me, remembrance is not so much about the pomp and the ceremony and the prayers and the services um, and any celebration of conflict, but more it's uh, what I find is a moment to just actually think back and remember not just those people who have lost their lives in conflict, um, not just in the armed forces, but all the other services um, and volunteers as well, but just the time to think and reflect on what it what it means, um, what it means to you. And, and, and for me, it was just about thinking about what someone like me had done, whether they chose to or not, um, for me now. So what I'd like to do is I have the good fortune here of my uh, my dad's dad, uh, my grandfather, um, Alf Travers, was in the 14th Battalion Sherwood Foresters. Um, and this is a letter which he wrote some months after being in in the Battle of uh, El Alamein in 1942. Um, I read this letter certainly once a year, probably around this time, and all I wanted to do was just just share it with you because I just think it paints a picture of what it can be like to be in the middle of something like this, yet somehow life carries on. Um, so um, the letter is written to, to Vera, who was actually my grandfather's sister. Interesting dynamic here is he never felt able to write to his wife because she would have worried. So would write to Vera, his sister, who would then relay the information to her in person rather than her reading it in a letter. Um, so just to explain. So here we are. This is from Private AJ Travers, 14th Battalion, Sherwood Foresters. Dear Vera, many thanks for the letter received today. I'm pleased to say that I'm receiving quite a few letters from you lately. Glad to hear you are keeping all right. I'm still getting along okay myself. I'm very pleased to hear that you did not tell mum about Stan. I have not heard from him since I last wrote to you. That was the last week, of course, so I am not due for one yet, am I? The price of cigarettes is very cheap out here, Vera. Woodbines run out for about three pence for ten. And on top of that, we have a free issue of 50 a week. So you can see that we do all right as far as cigs go. I think that the price of cigarettes in England is disgusting. I just think it's amazing that he opens up the letter talking about stuff like that, given what, what comes next. Now, Vera, you have asked me to tell you about what we're up to in action. Well, the only person I have wrote to about it is Wag, and I asked him not to let anyone, especially Ivy, see it. So seeing that you've asked me, I will to the best explain the Battle of El Alamein, and I will ask you not to show Mum or Ivy. I know that you understand, but I thought that I would mention this to you. As you know, after arriving in Egypt, I spent a few months in, tr- in transit camp, training, going on schemes and getting climatised. I moved from this camp, which is about just a few miles in the desert, to a camp of our own about 50 miles into the desert, where we carried out training for a few more weeks. We started out on a scheme one day, just as the same we had done many times before. It was about two o'clock on the 19th of October. In the day when we started out, after doing about 20 miles, we stopped to mash up, in brackets, make tea. When we had finished this meal, the officers gave us a lecture and told us that this was not a scheme, but the real thing. Well, I must say that this did not come as a surprise to me, as I had a good idea as to what was happening. You can imagine that the chaps, after hearing this, they were cracking jokes about it, and I must say that they were not very much concerned at all. As a matter of fact, they were quite cheerful about it. From now on, we were on alert. We started to move up on the first leg of our journey to meet the Jerry. We moved by night and rested by day. 
on the 23rd of October, we were just 12 miles from the start point. The officers go into conference and we were given the dope. The front was 30 miles wide, stretching from north to south with the Mediterranean as the north flank. We were to take an objective about 15 miles inland and we were attached to a New Zealand division. We were told that at 9.40, the RAs were going to put down the biggest concentrated barrage ever for 40 minutes, and then the infantry were to advance on the objective under a creeping barrage, and we were to go through the gap in the minefields that the infantry had made to hold the ground. We were also told that this was the beginning of the end, and this cheered us up a great deal. No stopping, it was to be straight through, and we were expected to break through in 10 days. We were also told it was a sticky job, and we had the toughest job of the battle. Well, I think that was most of the dope we got. I spent this day rather quietly with my officer. Most of the morning I spent trying to repair my Jeep. I expect you might have seen these Jeep cars on the films. I will add that I was towed right up at this point with a blown gasket. Anyway, they gave me a new Jeep at the last minute. I should just say here that his role, I believe the term is a, is a captain's Batman. So his job was to, uh, to drive and escort uh, the captain. My job was to drive for my officer and to act as platoon runner. The running was done with the Jeep, not on foot. We are getting ready for the big night now. My officer and I had a bath in an old petrol tin and a clean change of clothes. Then we decided to have a good feed with food that we'd saved up in the last few days. So I cooked a good meal. Again, the old petrol tins came into use and we had our fill. All this messing about kept my mind off the job we were about to start. Time is getting short now. I glance over to where the lads are and they were playing football and appeared to be quite unconcerned. I watched them during the afternoon. There they were cleaning their rifles as they'd never cleaned them before and without being told. By the way, perhaps I had better tell you that our platoon is an anti-tank platoon consisting of four guns carried on lorries and seven men to each team. Off we go. It's about 6.30 now and just going dusk. All of the lads seem to be quite happy. I will say that this was the day that I'd been dreading ever since I'd been dragged into the army. But I felt okay. We reached the start point after crawling along for a couple of hours. We've got about half an hour's wait now and we start to dig slit trenches as a precautionary measure. All of a sudden the barrage opens up. I was amazed that I had just stood watching. I could not believe my own eyes for a few minutes. Then all at once I decided I would dig my trench and get in it. As you know, Vera, I've heard some barrages in London, but this got me spellbound. It seemed just as though the world had opened up on this one spot. This went on for about 40 minutes and now the infantry are starting on their task. In they go, hundreds of them, and not a murmur. These New Zealand chaps are a fine lot and they've never been known to fail to take their objective. This time they were true to form. The signal went up that they had got there. It was about 12.30 and the moon is shining just like daylight. We start to move in now. As we move through the minefield, we see some of the wounded infantry bringing back hundreds of prisoners. Grand chaps, those New Zealand chaps, never moan and just take things as a matter of course. Dawn is just breaking now. We are going into open formation, all vehicles some distance apart to safeguard against bombing attacks. And none too soon. Jerry did not lose much time before he started dropping his load. There were dozens of planes up, all dogfights all round. We could not quite make out what was going on at this stage. As you can imagine, we are now in a strange desert and we got there during the night. After the air fighting had died down a bit, I started to mash up as we had nothing since the previous afternoon and it gets very cold during the night, even in the Egyptian desert. Well, I had just about got the water on when I had to peek up ready to move we now moved right up onto El Alamein's ridge, which the New Zealanders were holding, put our guns down in position, 
and we're ready to take on enemy tanks. We did not get much peace here. Jerry was putting all the head into the battle. His artillery and mortar fire was terrific, but our artillery was even worse for him. And on top of that, we had hundreds of planes going over the lines, which to us was a grand sight. Well, I kept trying to mash some tea and eventually I managed to succeed at about 12 a.m. We did not feel much like eating at this time. I kept going round our guns with my officer until about three. By this time, I was getting used to the noise and the stuff that Jerry was sending over. We get the warning that his tanks are putting in a counterattack and our gun teams stand to their guns. I am just behind the ridge. Our tanks are moving about just in front, getting into position. A few of them get hit and go up in flames. This does not look so good. And then they start withdrawing behind us to take up new positions. I did not feel very comfortable at this stage. I saw a slit trench near, so in I went. I think it was my worst experience to date. Our tanks being just behind us made us a good target. They were throwing over everything they had. Then our tanks seemed to be going back, leaving us in between them and the Jerry tanks. Well, I can assure you, I did not feel at all comfortable, and after staying there for about two hours, which seemed years, our tanks managed to beat them off. What a relief. It was beginning to get dark now, and we received orders to move into Liga. This means no hot drinks tonight, and we cannot make a fire after dark. We get to our night Ligaing area about 8pm, and after filling up with supplies, we get down on the desert to sleep with our own artillery banging away at Jerry all the time. At about 2.30am, we are woken up and told to get ready to move once again. Then we are told that we are going to put in a night attack again, and round comes the rum ration, which I refused, for at that time I thought that they were trying to key us up with it, but I found out after it was issued because we had not had a hot drink for two nights. Off we go to make the attack. There was a dive bombing attack made on some transport about a mile in front of us and a 12 lorry full of petrol and loaded with ammunition was hit and set on fire, right near the gap in the minefield that we've got to go through. This made things look 10 times worse than they really were, with the whole place lit up. Anyway, you know what orders are and we've got to pass them and only at about three miles an hour. This seemed to prolong the agony. We get through the gap and get to grips with Jerry, mopping up machine gun posts and infantry. We took hundreds of prisoners again. Whilst waiting for information at this spot, I just walked about for 30 to 40 yards from my Jeep to have a glance round. No rifle and just smoking a cigarette. Then I saw two figures coming out of what appeared to be a trench. And much to my relief, when they saw me, they were using the old favourite, Comrade. I had learned my lesson and believed I would never go around without a rifle again. I was in a cold sweat. We carry on though. The night until the last of the tanks clash and the fireworks started, tanks and transport were hit and set on fire all around us. Things seemed to be going all wrong as the day broke. Jerry made his counter-attack and it seemed as though we were trapped. This was the worst fire I'd seen yet. Tanks withdrew and it left us smack in the middle of it. Well, it was just like hell let loose. I was dashing around with my officer who was giving instructions and putting the guns down to meet the tanks, but I'm afraid he had taken us by surprise. And within an hour, we were given orders to withdraw to the ridge we had held the previous day. We had rather heavy casualties here and I lost quite a lot of transport too. Anyway, we held the ridge until dark and then night leaguered again. We had to dig some holes to sleep in and eventually we got some sleep. At first light, I hear some moving about and putting my head out of the blankets, I saw that everyone was mashing up and cooking breakfast. It was not long before I got our breakfast going and had a good wash. The news came round that we had been relieved by another unit and we're going back a couple of miles for a refit and reorganise. So I thought we would be left out in the battle for a couple of weeks, needless to say I'd had enough and was rather pleased to think that we would be at least get a rest. I spent this day doing nothing but sleep in between the bombing raids that we got and the bombardment for Jerry's artillery. The next day I got rather a shock. 
that the ridge that we took the first night was going to be held and no further attempt to break through was going to be made. But we were to go with another unit and put in another attack. The dope came round that we were to make a box in Jerry's lines. The infantry were to make a gap in the minefield and we were to go through the infantry and hold the ground while our armour came through and the ground was going to be held at all costs. Well, after the last do, I did not feel like starting on this and after getting all keyed up for it, it was put off for 24 hours. This made things worse. The night came again and off we go. I think it was about 12 miles to the start line. Anyway, there is no moon tonight, not until late anyway, and we cannot see for dust that the tanks make. They were, by the way, were travelling with us about five yards to our left. On the way, I got sandwiched by our own lorries twice, and once by a tank. We could see its big form coming up to us, but it's no use shouting to them because they can't hear. It hit us in the side where my officer was sitting, but neither of us got hurt, and the jeep was still okay. They're tough, these jeeps. As we're going along, we have a little drink of gin to warm us up and my officer shook hands with me and wished each other good luck. Well, I said, it can't be any worse than the last lot. Little did we know what we were in for. We got to the start point too early and we had to wait for about two hours on the spot that Jerry had just been driven out of and of course he had the range of it for his mortar bombs. He just played merry hell with us. We got more casualties in this two hours than we did in the last battle. Once again, I'm lucky. Whilst waiting to move, I helped bandage some of the wounded and lift them onto the transport. And this did not give us a very nice feeling for the job we had in front of us. We go through the minefield at first light and in front of the infantry, we get down to hold the ground and take on the enemy tanks. Six of our tanks came past us and in the direction of Jerry. And in many minutes, we were in flames. They had a couple of guns that we could not shift. The rest of our tanks leave us once again. There was nothing for it. I could not do anything with my Tommy gun. So it was a slit trench I got and stayed there for five hours. We stood here something that I will not think is possible for human beings to stand. It was terrible. He must have got used to the kind of bomb and machine gun that we had. We got the order to get out as best as we could at about two, and all of our transport were there. There was only one lorry left that was any good, and this one was packed. My jeep was just behind the slit trench, was riddled with machine gun bullets. This is where I lose all my clothes and most of my kit, which I'd looked after since the first day in the army. I managed to grab a small pack and a great coat, both of which were riddled also. It looked just as though rats had been eating it. We managed to get out and got to our meeting place at dusk. A chap came up to me and asked if I'd like a bottle of beer. Well, Vera, you know how much I like a beer, and I must say it was the first drink I had enjoyed for a very long time. Down to bed again, browned off. We then woken at about 4.30 in fright and being told to get ready to move again. Well, that was just about putting the tin hat on it, but still it had to be done. It was not too bad after all. And I've already told you, we were given, ta- we were given 10 days to break up Jerry. Well, this was 4.30 a.m. on the 11th day and we'd got to try and catch Jerry as he was running. I travelled about 300 miles past Matru and did not see Jerry at all. All I could see were thousands of prisoners crawling back and hundreds of lorries and guns and tanks that had been left behind. Well, Vera, I hope this has not been too boring. I've tried to tell you what happened in the battle. Please excuse the spelling mistakes. I know there are many but I've been trying to keep the picture in mind more than the spelling. Cheerio for the time being, wishing you all the best in health and luck. Your loving brother, Alf.